we're going to start with a question, if I can get my mouse in the right window, uh, of Hélène Henault from about 10 years ago. Suppose I have two smooth projective varieties over a field that's not algebraically closed, and they have they are derived equivalent. They have equivalent derived categories of coherent sheaves. And the question is, if one has a rational point, must the other also have a rational point? And to spoil the punchline today, I'm going to say no. And I'm going to have examples with abelian surfaces and hypercalar fourfolds. And if you're not into derived categories, as um, as, as Jordan suggests, uh, there will be at the end a Brouwer-Mannian story that may be of independent interest. So why, why is this a good question? Why should we be interested in this? Um, first of all, uh, general curiosity about how much the derived category knows. So for example, it knows uh, the dimension of your space. It knows the canonical ring and the anti-canonical ring. So if you're, if you're variety is Fano or Antifano, then it knows everything about the variety. Um, it knows if your field is a subfield of, of C, then it knows the rational, even the even rational cohomology and the odd rational cohomology and their Hodge structures. It knows the even and odd et al cohomology uh, with their Galois actions. It knows the rational Chow groups when you put them all together, but it doesn't know the grading. It doesn't know the ring structure. It doesn't know the integral structure. Well, it knows a different integral structure, the one coming from K-theory, but it doesn't know your favorite one. It doesn't know the fundamental group, the Brouwer group, the birational type. And when I say it doesn't know, I mean uh, we have examples of derived equivalences between varieties where um, those invariants are different. And the second reason to ask this question is just general, there are a lot of dreams of using derived categories to study birational geometry due to Bondalorlov, Kawamata, Kuznetsov, Katsarkov, a lot of people are interested in this question. And, and increasingly, we, we're, I think it's clear that if you are interested in birational geometry, you should also be interested in arithmetic. Um, or at least that's, that's what I keep learning from Brendan Hassett. Uh, so for example, we have a paper with him and Chinkle and Verily Alvarado, where we have some cubic fourfolds, hybrid and sextic del pezzo surfaces, and we're interested in their birational geometry. And even though everything's over C, we need to know a lot about the arithmetic of sextic del pezzo surfaces. Okay, so what was known already about this question? Um, over finite fields, if you have a curve or a surface or a threefold or an abelian variety, then not just having a rational point, but actually the number of rational points is a derived invariant. And the conjecture of Orlov would imply that this continues in higher dimensions. Um, and I've looked long and hard for counterexamples to that conjecture and so far not succeeded. Uh, for curves, well, in genus zero and genus two or more, um, they're either Fano or anti-Fano, and so there's, there's nothing interesting. But in genus one, Antio, Krashen, and Ward show that, um, well, they don't have to be, if you have derived equivalent genus one curves, they don't have to be um, isomorphic as they would over an algebraically cl closed field, but one has a rational point if and only if the other, other one does. Uh, Hassett and Chinkel have studied K3 surfaces. They don't have complete results, but they have some interesting results. So if you have derived equivalent K3 surfaces over R, then the real manifolds that you're talking about are homeomorphic. Um, they have some results over local fields that I won't try to summarize, but that are interesting. Um, and in general, they show that if you have derived equivalent K3 surfaces and one has a rational point, then the other one has a zero cycle of degree one. So it's really hard to find counterexamples with K3 surfaces because first you'd have to find a K3 surface that has a zero cycle of degree one, but no rational point. And that's already tough before you think about any of the derived issues. Um, uh, Asher, Perry, Dasarata, and Joe showed that they, they have a counterexample with a derived where you have two K3 surfaces over one of these fields that I'm showing you, Brouwer classes on each, and a derived equivalence of categories of twisted sheaves, and, uh, and one has a rational point and one doesn't. So, um, so that's a negative answer, but once you allow twisted sheaves to come in. And then the last bit of review I want to do is Asher Al and Marcello Bernardara have studied, uh, they have some results on geometrically rational surfaces. For example, 
Um, a Del Pezzo surface of degree at least five has a rational point if and only if its derived category admits what's called a full exceptional collection. So the derived category knows at least something about rational points. And I should, I should add that Matt Ballard and his collaborators are also interested in those kind of results and they have a different definition of exceptional collection. So, so beware if you're reading that literature. Right, so let me talk about our results. Um, so first we're gonna have some abelian counterexamples. So for every, so you can't do it with elliptic curves, with, well, with genus one curves, but in every higher dimension, you can get, uh, say, an abelian surface over Q and a non-trivial torsor over it, so no rational points and a derived equivalence between them. And the same is true over function fields. And we deduce this from our second theorem, which is that for any curve of genus greater than or equal to one over any field, the Jacobian, so pick naught of the curve, is derived equivalent to pick G minus one of the curve. So the Jacobian is your abelian variety and pick G minus one is your torsor. And so to deduce the second theorem from the first one, we dig through old papers to find some explicit curves such that pick G minus one doesn't have any rational points, um, which by the way is slightly stronger than saying that there are no line bundles of degree G minus one. There's a subtlety there that turns out to be really interesting. Um, so the curves over Q we get from a paper of Correa and Manuel and it's beautifully explicit curve. It's like y squared equals 605 million x to the six plus 18 x squared minus, well, you know, is they really write it down and it's great. Uh, and the, oh, for the function field case, we get it from a paper of Poonen and Stoll. Okay, so what goes into the proof of theorem two? Just some of the ideas. Um, Oh, by the way, if you know more examples of curves like this, I'm, I'm interested in this kind of thing, so, so let me know. Uh, so you have Mukai's famous derived equivalence between an abelian variety and its dual. And you know that the Jacobian of a curve is self-dual um, because it's a principally polarized abelian variety and the, um, the principal polarization is the theta divisor. So let's talk about the theta divisor. So I'm going to, on the product, pick naught, cross, pick G minus one. And forgive me, I'm going to talk about geometric points a little bit informally rather than something, something more formal. I'm going to look at the set of pairs. L is degree zero. M is a degree G minus one line bundle such that their tensor product has, no H, has some H1. So generically, you'd expect it to have no sections and no H1. And I'm saying look at the ones that have sections and H1. Um, so over the origin in pick naught, the fiber of this thing is the canonical theta divisor in pick G minus one. It's the line bundles with sections. Um, you may think of the theta divisor as living in pick naught, but it's more natural to have it live in pick G minus one. And then over other points of pick naught, you get translates of the theta divisor. So you're seeing pick naught as a moduli space of line bundles on pick G minus one. Um, so I'll answer, I'll answer your questions later. Well, some, what, someone asked this theorem one over, hold over arbitrary number fields. Um, if you can find me more curves, then, then it will hold over more number fields. I don't doubt that they're out there. I just didn't know where to find them. Um, right. And so this line bundle O of D realizes pick naught as a fine modulized piece of sheaves on pick G minus one and vice versa of, of line bundles. Uh, and then we just repackage Mukai's proof that the, an abelian variety is derived equivalent to its dual. And we show that O of D induces an equivalent. So you start on pick naught, you pull up in tensor with O of D, you push down to pick G minus one and that's an equivalence. So that's our first example. Um, it's nice, maybe you're disappointed that my, my abelian surface and its torsor, when I go up to the algebraic closure, they become the same, right? They become isomorphic. So it's just two different forms of the same variety. Maybe that's disappointing to you. And so we have a second example, which is fancier. Um, so there's an explicit K3 surface defined over the rational numbers. Um, and I'll show you the equation at the end of the talk. Uh, and two smooth projective four-dimensional moduli spaces of sheaves on it. 
such that um, one of them has infinitely many rational points. Uh, the other one has no rational points. And in, well, I won't prove this for you now, but it also has no zero cycle of degree one. And uh, so unlike Hassett and Schinkel's result about K3 surfaces themselves and their derived equivalent. And moreover, if you go up to C uh, or Q bar, but why not go all the way to C, they don't become isomorphic or even birational. And if it makes you happy to know that X and Y are simply connected because derived equivalences of non-simply connected varieties can be a little screwy, um, that's, that's true. Okay, so I need to, before I tell you more about X and Y, I need to tell you something about the geometry of degree two K3 surfaces. So you start with the plane and you choose a smooth sextic curve. Uh, this curve might look quartic to you, but it, it's meant to be sextic. And then you take the double cover of P2 branched over that sextic curve. So you're imagining a, like a pillow up in the air, double cover ramified over the smooth sextic curve. And the other thing you need to know um, is that if I have a line downstairs, then it's pre-image upstairs is going to be a genus two curve. And that line can move around, right? So every line gives me a different genus two curve upstairs. Uh, some of them are singular, right? If the line is tangent to the sextic, then the curve upstairs is singular. And we get a linear system of genus two curves upstairs. And actually it's a complete linear system. And then there's some fine print here. I want to choose my sextic so that the K3 surface has geometric Picard rank one. So the Picard group is just Z generated by our, our the class of C. And that will in particular give us that all of these, these curves can be singular, but they can't be reducible or non-reduced. Okay, so what are the two fourfolds? Um, they are the moduli spaces of sheaves on S of rank zero, first turn class C, and Euler characteristic either minus one or zero. And I say it that way because we know a lot about moduli spaces of sheaves on K3 surfaces. We know sort of everything about their cohomology. We know a lot about their birational geometry over C. Um, but a more geometric, oh, there's symplectic varieties that if you like that, like algebraic symplectic. I usually say holomorphic symplectic, but today I'm over Q. Um, but a more geometric picture of what they are is that X is, so a minute ago we had this family of genus two curves over, over the dual P2 of lines in our first P2. And X is the relative compactified pick knot of that family. So these sheaves are all either line bundles on curves in the linear system or some rank one torsion free sheaves on singular groups. And Y is the relative pick one of that family. So this starts to sound like what we were discussing in the first half of the talk. Um, the derived equivalence between them is just a family version of our earlier equivalence. That definition of D that I gave had good enough hygiene that it, start, it works in a family with, with not too much modification. Of course, now we have singular curves and so X and Y are fibered in abelian surfaces, well, abelian surfaces and torsors over them. Um, but there are some singular fibers, right? And that's where all the hard work is. But that hard work was done by Dima Rinken in about 10 years ago. And with Will Donovan and Kieran Meekin, I studied this example a few years ago over C, and we were interested in exotic autoequivalences of derived categories. So that's how I know this example. Now we want to talk about rational points. Um, so X, which you remember was this compactified pick knot. So it's fibered in abelian surfaces. It has lots of rational points because every curve in that linear system has a degree zero line bundle, OC. And it's fun to think about, if you like Hilbert schemes, X is birational to the Hilbert scheme of two points on the K3 surface. And that guy also has a lot of rational points because you can take the rational points in P2 and pull them up. Um, so if you want to check out of the talk right now and just, just think about that for the next five minutes or whatever. Um, you could do worse. It's pretty fun, pretty fun example. Uh, they're not birational. Uh, Justin Sewan noticed this. Um, and you just, it's just a standard um, hypercalar technique. The, the bovial bogomola forms on the Picard groups of X and Y have different discriminants. So, so that's nice. Um, y, 
which was this compactified pick one, it has, it has points everywhere locally, as the rational points people like to say. It has points over R and over every QP. But we're going to choose our sextic carefully so that Y doesn't have any rational, any actual rational points. And here's how we're going to do it. We're going to take the Brouwer class. So you might want there to, so Y is a moduli space of sheaves on, on S. You might want there to be a universal sheaf on the product, but there's a Brouwer class on Y that obstructs that. For X, it happens to vanish. For Y, it's order two. And we're gonna use alpha as a brouwer monian obstruction to rational points on Y. So the two best things that you can do with a Brouwer class, um, we're, going to, we're going to do them both at once. Uh, let me say a little bit about the brouwer monian story because some of you know it much better than I do. Um, and, and some of you don't know it at all. Uh, oh, one of you asks, uh, oh, sorry. So one of you asks if S is an elliptic K3. No, it's, um, it's a double cover of P2 and so branched over a sextic. And so you get a bunch of genus two curves on it. You get a P2's worth of genus two curves on it. Sorry, this is, this is the problem with uh, slides, right? Right, so remember we have this, this Brouwer class on alpha coming from the fact that it's a moduli space of geometrically stable sheaves. And there are no semi-stable sheaves in the picture yet. And the general brouwer monian strategy is for every real point of Y, you want to take alpha and evaluate it of Y and get the non-trivial element of the Brouwer group of R. And then at every QP point, you want to evaluate it and get zero. So that's what we're hoping will happen. And why does that obstruct rational points? Well, if you had a rational point, it would give you uh, real and p -adic points. But there's this famous exact sequence that everyone tells me is class field theory. And someday I hope to understand why it, why it is class field theory. Um, but the problem would be that alpha evaluated at y would go to a half comma zero, zero, zero at all the p -adics, which would not go to zero. And so, this, but the sequence is exact. So, so there could have been no rational point. Okay, so we said that for every real point, we want the Brouwer group to be, the, the Brouwer class to be non-trivial. And there are real points, we can't get away from them. And it turns out you just have to ask for S to have no real points itself. You want the sextic to be negative everywhere, and then you make a little argument. Now, here's the really fun one. Um, for the p-adic points, if you, if you get a model of everything over Z and reduce to FP, now the, the, now the geometric Picard group of your surface has to grow. And so you might have to start worrying about semi-stable sheaves. And if you don't, then it's, it's sort of, it involves a lot of technology, but the technology is all there to say that the, um, the Brouwer class will have to vanish at every p -adic point. And I think this is an interesting technique that, um, that people should explore further. So you can ask me about it in the reception if you're interested. This is, um, it could have some mileage in it. Now, of course, there will be finitely many primes where you have a problem. These are sort of the primes of bad reduction for Y that are not primes of bad reduction for S, where you have to worry about semi-stable sheaves creeping into your moduli problem, um, or some curves in that linear system becoming reducible, or equivalently, the, the sextic curve downstairs had some lines that were tangent to it at three points. So there you do some work. Uh, and you find conditions to, to control those finitely many primes. And then you ask the computer to search and search until it finds um, a K3 surface that lists our, that satisfies our laundry list of conditions. So um, I got some good advice from Stefan Elson Hans that made this possible, but it's, it's really sort of at the edge of what the computer is capable of. Um, we could have written the theorem for quartic K3s but I don't think we could have done the computer part. And so then there's no paper. Uh, here's, the, here's the K3. W squared is that sextic. Um, and then the primes that give us trouble, I just want to tell you because this is fun. The primes are 5, 31, 75, 17, that guy, and that guy. And, uh, and then you check, you check that they don't give you trouble. And in the long talk, I would tell you what goes into that, but that's all my time. So thank you very much. Thank you.
Uh, let's open it up for questions. Please raise your hand. Sorry. I will start with Alexander Petrov. Oh, yeah, uh, I, was, I was going to ask about the finite field case. Uh, apparently I'm missing something, but why doesn't the positive answer follow from the existence of topological periodic cyclic homology? Ah, right. Which? Yeah, we, everyone who's interested in this question briefly gets excited about that and then realizes the problem, oh, do I dare go back that many slides? Um, the thing that's in invariant is a sum of the even and odd cohomology, but, but with a bunch of tape twists that... Um, oh, I see. Um, that, that screw you up. And in, in low dimensions, you can recover, but in higher dimensions, um, you can't... Uh, oh, got it. So you only know that their numbers are congruent, mod, mod P or something. Yeah. Okay, I see. Uh, I believe... Is that, even, is that true? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, the tape twists really throw you up. I see. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Or we have another question from Arnav. Uh, yeah, if no one else was going to ask, I'd love to hear more about how you control the Barrow class mod P um, or at QP, given the non-existence of semi-stable sheaves when you reduce. Um, yeah, I, well, I don't know that I, I want to go into a ton of detail right now, but I'm happy to talk later. The, the short answer is that um, when you get when you get these reducible curves back in your linear system, I always was hate when people do this to their slides. So if our linear system has some some reducible, some geometrically reducible curves in it, then if both components were defined over Q, then then we're okay. And if they're defined over some degree to extension of Q, then you need to find a better sex state. Um. Um, one of you asked, how can you get rational singular cohomology from the derived category? Um, uh, the, um, well, the short answer is, if you have a, a map of derived categories, you get an induced map on rational cohomology. So that's why it's invariant. But there's also, oh, is it, is it Anthony Blanc's thesis where he constructs this topological, this topological K theory for categories over C? And, um, and then the topological K-theory tensor Q is the rational cohomology. Well, we have a question from Ariane. From? Yes, I have a question. Hi. Um, so X and Y, if I understood correctly, are uh, not birational, nor That's twist right. with one another. Are they deformation equivalent? Yes, so all, all moduli spaces of sheaves on K3s, uh, it, well, if they're smooth and projective. So if there are no semi-stables, then they're all deformations of the Hilbert scheme. Right, and is it maybe possible to find uh, two examples which aren't deformation equivalent? Uh, with, um, I, I mean, I hope so. I, I wouldn't know where to look. I've sort of looked, it would, so a great next question would be, can you find examples with Calabio threefolds? And I've looked at the, Examples I know of derived equivalences of Calabi-L threefolds over C, and um, and none of them are sort of easy to translate into into obstructing rational points. But I I would hope that they're out there. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we should we should end here. Uh, let's all thank Nick again. Thanks, guys, uh, for a great talk.